you would turn with me to Exodus chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, going to look at verses 13 through 20, and then Exodus 11 and 1. Exodus chapter 3, 13 through 20. Can you give me some more juice, Deborah? If you have the King James Version, you'll find these holy, divine, and inspired words. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, Well, what is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he says, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to the voice, to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. Ye shall say unto them, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt would not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And Moses, I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet, will I bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go hence. When he shall let you go, he shall surely thrust you out hence all together. The word of God. <clears throat> For just a few minutes, my brothers and my sisters in Christ, Jesus, our living Lord, I want to talk from the thought, from the subject, if you will. I want to talk about the plagues of Egypt. I want to talk about the plagues of Egypt. I told you last week we will be looking, of course, at the plagues of Egypt. Starting next week, we will be looking at plague number one, and we will go through all of the ten plagues. But I need to introduce this to you to show you why he sent the plagues and just how many he sent and why he sent the amount that he did sin. The term plague is, by definition, something which is always compared to the plagues of Egypt. We hear people, Georgia Winfield, speak of something happening. You may hear them say, that was such as a biblical proportion. So they're comparing the current catastrophes to the biblical proportions that they connect or associate with the plagues of Egypt. So that's the thing, Reverend Owens, that the world, even though some don't believe it, 
but that's the thing that the world measures the standard against because when we look at plagues, they will measure those against the plagues of Egypt even though some don't believe the plagues of Egypt took place, if that makes sense. The Hebrew word for plague is nega. Almost sounded like I'm talking to some of y'all. <laughs> nega. It means a blow. It means a stroke. It means a womb or punishment. Even got the same connotation probably. It means being stricken in some way and it's painstakingly clear that God is the one who's meeting out the punishment. So as we look at these 10 plagues, we say, well, why 10? Avana, why not seven? Why not five? Why not six? Why 10? There are four biblical numbers in the Bible that denote completion and or perfection. Those numbers are three, seven, ten, and twelve. These all, Dr. Matthews, mean completion and perfection. But while each number represents completion or perfection, it's a different type of completion or perfection. All right? Now, we know, brothers and sisters, that three is divine perfection. We know that. We know that there is something special about the number three. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, Sister Henry, in Proverbs, he said, things that's just too wonderful for me to, to understand. I can't figure them out. God has blessed me with wisdom and knowledge, but there's three things that even I can't explain to you. I, I can't understand. He said, the first one is, he said, it's the way of an eagle in the air. He said, I can't, I can't figure that thing out. I, I, can't, I, I can't do that. He said, secondly, he said, the way of a serpent on a rock. He said, I can't, Jerry, I can't figure this thing out. And then thirdly, he said, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea. And then even though Andrew, he said, there's three things he can't figure out. And then he threw a fourth one in. And then the last one, he said, and I can't really understand the way of a man with a virgin. It's in there. He said, I can't figure that out. Can't, can't figure those things out. So we know this, this three is a, a, a holy number. Paul, as he wrote to the church, Jeff, in Thessalonica, he said, I pray that God would bless you and sanctify you spirit, soul, and body. So even man is a dichotomy of three. And we know that God has the Father, he has the Son, he has the Holy Spirit, and even Satan has his evil trinity because it's the devil, it's the beast, and it's the false prophet. We know that the devil, he doesn't imitate anything that's not real, so he always tries to imitate and mimic that which is true of God. And you remember Paul said, I don't remember, Minister Perry, this happening. It was about 14 years ago. Whether it was in the flesh or not, I don't know. He said, but I was caught up in the third heaven. And he said, Spoon, the things I saw, I couldn't tell you because if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And I can't put into words the stuff that I did see when I was up there. So we know that that three, that's divine perfection. And then seven, we know, seven represents spiritual perfection. Seven represents spiritual perfection. You remember Revelation 1.10, John says in verse 9, Raquel, he said that I was in the spirit on the Lord's day when they put him on an Isle of Patmos. And he said, when I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, he said, I, 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 I heard a voice. I heard somebody tap me on the shoulder and the voice said, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last, I'm the beginning and the end. He said, now John, what I need you to do is I need you to write some stuff and I'm getting ready to show you something and I need you to write it in the book and I need you to write it to the 12, ch seven churches of Asia Minor. I need you to write it to the church of Ephesus. I need you to write it to the church at Smyrna. I need you to write it to the church at Pergamos. I need you to write it to the church at Thyatira. I need you to write it to the church at Sardis. I need you to write it to the church in Philadelphia. I need you to write it to the church of Laodicea. And John said, when I looked at the one that was talking John said he didn't look 
like a natural man, John said. He, he had hair like lamb's wool and black folk trying to make him black because John said his hair was like lamb's wool. That was not describing his race. That was describing him in his judicial character. John said he, he had red eyes when I looked at him and, and the eyes was as flames of fire. And that talks about the purifying judgment of God. And he said, and then I looked down at his feet and they was like fine brass when I looked down at him. And then John said, Dre, and in the midst of that, he said, there was some stuff that I saw. He said, there were seven golden candlesticks. And then John said, there were seven stars that was in his right hand. And then before he ended chapter one, he explained to us, he said, now let me tell you, for y'all get to going crazy and running, hiding up under your chairs and couches. He said, the seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. In other words, the seven stars are the pastors of the churches. And he said the seven golden candlesticks, those represent the churches themselves. And then in Revelation 4, 5, he said, and out of the throne proceeded lightning and thunderings and voices. And then there were seven lamps of fire that was burning before the throne, which are before the seven spirits of God. And if you want to know what the seven spirits of God are, you can do some homework on yourself. Y'all ain't going to work me to death. It's in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. You can find it. So we see that seven is spiritual perfection. Now listen to me, 12. Now, 12 means governmental perfection. Listen to me, 12. I'm doing like Jesus. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Do you know it is not coincidence that there are 12 people on the jury? God had this figured out in Exodus. And we think we smart with our judicial system. There's a reason there's 12. Because 12 represents, again, governmental perfection. You know that there's 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? And you remember Jesus told the apostles, he said, don't worry. Don't get this understand. Remember, you're going to judge the angels. You remember when he was walking with the disciples, the Bible said in Mark chapter 3, he took all of his disciples and he had them on a cliff and he went in God to his father in prayer. And then out of them, he chose 12 whom he called apostles. And the apostles knew that the number meant government of perfection because when Judas died, when he hung himself, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, it ain't 11 of us. We understand what the number 12 means. They said, now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cast lots and make somebody take his spot so that there's 12 of them so we will be complete in our governmental perfection. So they got the 120 together and they cast lots and the lot only fell on two of them. And out of that two, they chose Matthias. And then Acts said he was numbered with the 11 apostles and he made them 12. Because 12 meant governmental perfection. And then the number... 10. And what 10 means, Brandy Campbell, that refers to perfection or completion of God's divine order. That's why there's 10 plagues and not 11. That's why there's 10 and not 8. 10 is the only one of the perfect biblical numbers in which human beings have a part to play. We cannot be a part of the three. We can't be a part of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We cannot be a part of the seven because the seven deals with spiritual perfection and we already know that we ain't perfect. We are maturing. We can't be a part of the 12. Paul even understood that because he said, I'm not meet to be called an apostle. I wasn't there with y'all. Y'all walk with him. And the scripture says in Acts 2 that in order to be an apostle, you had to be at the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry. And I don't understand how we get apostles today because you got to be over 2,000 years old to meet the requirement. And you go in the back of a Rolling Stone magazine and now you're an apostle. When the scripture say you had to be at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the baptism of John the Baptist. Do you know anybody that they fit that? We got an apostle on every corner. Paul said, I'm not meet to be, I can't do that. He said, I was one born out of due time. Y'all saw Jesus walk. Y'all saw him cry. Y'all saw him hunger. He said, I met the exalted Christ. I don't even need to be a part of y'all. Right, 
He said, because I don't fit in that 12. Now, if Paul said he don't fit, 